Kids Week 2019 has been a huge success. We've seen hundreds of kids from all over the triad join us for a week of superhero fun. Most importantly, these kids have heard the gospel of Jesus, that while we are all sinners, Jesus, God's perfect son, died on the cross to pay for our sins and rose from the grave to give us new life. We believe that the gospel conversations that happened this week will have an impact for eternity. It's been amazing to see the church come together to pull all of this off. We've seen so many people donate supplies, invite neighbors, and over 500 people jump in and serve. It's your generosity that fueled life change in kids this week, and we praise God together for the stories of what He's done in so many kids' lives. Thank you. All right, guys, welcome to Mercy Hill. Uh, especially if you're at one of our campuses today, we want to welcome you, and we just want to start our sermon time today by celebrating what God has done through Kids Week. So many of y'all sacrificed, so many of y'all put your time and talent on the line, and man, it was just a life-changing week at Mercy Hill Church. Y'all, we had over 500 people serve. We had right at 800 kids that came to our uh, Kids Week this week. We need to praise God for that. And, uh, and what's, uh, that's really not a final number because the last day is today. So we're going to see uh, how many maybe new kids show up and we're going to give them the whole superhero deal and all that. Uh, but anyway, man, we're really pumped for everything that we saw. Listen, you might be one of the new families that came because of Kids Week. That happens every year. And I would love for just for a minute here before we dive into the sermon to let you know why we do Kids Week and, uh, and really what this church is all about. Y'all, we do Kids Week, your kids and our kids, all in the same boat. This is what we believe about them. We really believe that God loves them more than we do. <laughs> we believe that God has plans for them that are far greater than the plans that we can even make for them. And so for that, uh, we want to get them involved in understanding the Bible, understanding what God has for them, getting them around Christian community. And if you were newer this week and you had the opportunity to have your kids come, we really hope that you were blessed. Uh, we really think that for you and your family, man, this is a place where you can get on his mission. You can figure out the way that God has wired you so that you can kind of discover your calling and purpose and live that out. Every single one of us, God has a plan for, for his mission. And we would love for you to plug in here if you don't have a church home and figure out what that is. So, man, we want you to we want you to live the adventure. We want your kids to have the opportunity to do that. So I hope that they were blessed this week. We have been in a series all summer uh, so, so far in the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to depart from that book today, but there is kind of a connection. We've been talking about this guy, David, who was a king a while back, a long time ago. Uh, he was a great king, but David had a son named Solomon. Now, David ended up writing a bunch of the book of Psalms that is right dead smack middle of the Bible. But one of the things that we learn uh, from today is that a couple of the Psalms are attributed to his son, Solomon. And so it's kind of cool with Kids Week, man, seeing that connection with David pouring into his son and then his son talking about how we pour into our own children here and how we should raise them. You know, we were in the middle of this uh, series and the, the text that we were going to be on on today uh, was uh, a crazy text, okay, text about David and adultery and murder and war and all this stuff, and I was like, man, I'm not sure the first week for a bunch of new kids' families coming in, uh, if that's the one we want to start on, okay? So what we decided to do, and I think this might become a rhythm for us, is, man, let's just take one week out of the year and let's just talk about sharpening kids, the next generation, whether you're a parent, whether you're not, there are kids in your life, it's all of our responsibility, so let's dig into that, all right? Psalm 127 is where we're going to be, and uh, we're going to spend some time in Psalm 127 today, and what I want to do is give you guys sort of uh, the, the thrust of this right up front, and the thrust of this right up front is that Psalm 127 is not primarily a psalm that is written to answer the question of how to raise kids. Listen to me. It's not about how, okay? I want you to know, and you know this if you dive a little bit deep and, th and think about it with me, how questions are always easier than why questions. Psalm 127 is not written for the how. Psalm 127 is written for the deeper question of why. And I want you to think about this. If I just caught you on the street and I just said to you, hey, how, do you, how should you raise kids? Oh, we all got opinions. I mean, all the, you know, eat this way, this type of thing with school, they need to go to bed at this time or whatever. All of us have a million opinions. But if somebody just stopped you cold and they said, why should people raise kids? 
would you have the pithy answer? It's a little different, right? It's a little bit of a harder thing to get to the bottom of. Why questions are always deeper than how questions. If you uh, have ever been around any kids at all, you already know that because they can unravel your philosophical underpinning of the world in two seconds with asking why, right? Oh, can we go to Chick-fil-A today? No. Why? Well, they're closed. Why? Well, it's Sunday. Why? Why is it Sunday? <laughs> I don't know, right? I don't know why it's Sunday. Do you have any other metaphysical things you want to, you know, deal with here, you little three-year-old, you know? It, it's, it's very, uh, why questions are so much deeper than how questions. Many of us have a lot of things about how, and I want us to talk from Psalm 127 today about why. Why does God give us these kids? Why does he give the church these children to raise? And all of us have a hand in being involved in the next generation why is it? See, many of us get caught up in the how, and every decision we make is about how. Well, how do we do this? How do we do that? How do we do this? How do we get this behavior? How do we get obedience, right? Like, how do we get them to form a little bit of character? How do we build some toughness in them? How do we, you know, whatever it is, we're always asking how. And what I want us to dive into today is this. Listen, if we get the why right, the how will sort of build itself. And maybe it won't build itself, but it will become very clear. If I, if I said to you today, hey, I want you to build a vehicle, you'd, you'd say, for what, right? Like if I said, no, just build a vehicle, I can't do that. Do you want it to drive 180 miles an hour? Because then I need to build a Corvette. Do you want it to haul 20,000 pounds? Because then I need to build it a little bit differently, dually, huge truck. Do you want it to be able to climb a mountain? Because then it's going to look a different way. It's going to look like a Jeep. Like the how becomes very clear. What it should look like in the day-to-day -day becomes clear if we can get the why in our mind. Okay, and I'm not saying it makes it easy, but it does make it clear and it gives us a path. Psalm 127 gives us the why. Here it is. Y'all, this is the big idea for the sermon today. God gives children to be raised for his mission. It's not our mission. It's not about their comfort. It's not about their safety. It's not about their joy. Uh-oh, it's not about our joy, <laughs> right? It's not about our identity. It's about his mission. We all have plans for them. We all have missions for them. We're all building them. The how should line up with the why. And if we can get the why right, then the how should become clear. It should begin to take care of itself. Y'all, God gives us these kids that we would raise them for his mission. And, uh, and I just want us to see today some of the things that we, and I fall right into this. I don't want anybody the whole time, I don't want there to be any kind of, well, I'm pointing my finger at you because, man, me and Anna wrestle with these things. We talk about these things. I struggle more than many in these areas, and people that know me know that, okay? Well, here, here's the deal. We, have, we, we begin to think about how and we replace the why. We start thinking about what we want to see in their life and all of a sudden the why in their life becomes getting a 5.0 GPA with AP classes. We, all of a sudden the why becomes making varsity. And all I want you guys to see, and I'm going to say this in at the end as well, those things are great. They're good. Push for them. I certainly do. I mean, I want to push our kids to be the best they can. They're just way too small to be the why of their life. They're way too small to hold the weight of their life, okay? God has a why for them that is beyond anything that we can imagine. It is the great adventure. Let's dive into this. Let's talk about kids and why God raises them or why God has given them to us as a church to steward and raise. Psalm 127, let's dive in. We're going to just kind of walk through this a little bit, and then I'll get into some of this why stuff, and that's going to be our time together. Uh, here we go, Psalm 127, 1 and 2, <clears throat> a song of ascents of Solomon, unless the Lord builds the house... Those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. All right, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it in vain. You can watch all day, but God is the one watching. You can rise up early. You can go to bed late. You can eat the bread of anxious toil. I love that. Who, have a, who among us have not done that? Well, we're biting our nails and we're sitting up late and we're worrying about something, but it is the Lord who gives when we trust in him to his beloved sleep. Now, I know you're, you're thinking to yourself, like, wait a minute, I thought this was about kids. Yeah, it is about kids. That's why we got to spend about the first 20 minutes talking about anxiety, <laughs> okay? We got to spend the first 20 minutes talking about trust. Because the sermon is eventually going to be, the, the whole, I mean, the whole psalm really is about kids. And if you've got kids or you've been around them, you, you know that. Nieces, nephews, you, you get it, right? Like, man, if this is about 
kids, then the first thing we got to get straight is, who's raising the kids? Whose are the kids? How should we be going about this? Man, we work hard, but we've got to trust deeply if we're going to raise kids at all. And this, this is the thing that I want us to kind of focus on. This applies to a thousand different areas, but let's just take it as it comes when we and, and start thinking about it with kids. Y'all, this passage, I think the first two verses has one principle, and this is it. Trust God without shirking human responsibility. You, you've, heard, you've heard the old, hey, you know, trust God, but keep your powder dry. You know, you've heard that, the, the Oliver Cromwell quote. Th- this is that idea where the Bible is getting us to see, listen, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. But you know what you learn in that? You learn that those who labor are supposed to be laboring, even though they understand that it is God who builds the house. Even though it is God who is watching the city, there is still a watcher. We watch as he's watching. We build as he's building. What I want you to see is that when it comes to raising children or really anything in your life, maybe you're facing something at work, maybe you're facing a financial situation, maybe you're facing a big relationship, uh, you know, question mark or parenting question or whatever it is, We've got to learn not to fall off either side. Have you ever seen the old westerns where the drunken cowboy jumps up and he falls off this side of the horse, then he jumps up and he falls off that side of the horse? Many of us do that. One side is human responsibility. The other side is the sovereignty of God. See, we can lean too far into trust so far that it takes us away from even working. Some people might trust so deeply where they're passive. Oh, well, God's going to do it. You know, whatever it is, raise the kids, let them do whatever they want. They're going to turn out however he wants them to. And we trust so deeply that we don't work. But the other part of this is we can work so deeply that we don't trust. And what we think is I work so deep. And what, what does that lead to? Well, I think what the Bible says is that leads to the eating the bread of anxious toil. It leads to late nights and early mornings and can't sleep and I'm chewing my nails and, and I'm worried about what's going on. Which side is that? That's probably not trusting so deeply that you're not working. That comes from working so deeply that we're not trusting. The wise path is holding both of these things in tension without falling off of either side or the other, all right? Wisdom, as I've told you before, is life by God's design. And this, written by Solomon, is a wisdom passage. What it's trying to get you to see is that there are, and I'll ask you this, which side are you on right now? Because many of us can lean one way or the other at different points in our life. Where are you today? Man, are you leaning into the trust? And that's a good thing until it becomes that it's breeding passivity in you and you don't even really want to work for what God has for you out there? Or are you leaning so far? And I bet I have my suspicions in this crowd that we're probably leaning on our own uh, two feet, put it on my back, let me get up early, let me ride, you know, go to bed late, let me kind of work all day, all night, I'm never going to rest. I'm leaning so far into work that I'm not trusting that God is really the one that watches out for me. Let me, let me speak to that for just a minute because I, I have my suspicion on our campuses as well that most of us might say, man, I've fought find myself there sometimes where I'm not thinking about what the Lord watching and building. I'm thinking about myself. And if that's where you are thinking about, I got to do more. I got to push harder. You know, in my job, I got to push harder in this relationship. I got to push harder when it comes to raising these kids because it's all resting on me. Here's what the, this is the lie. Can I give you the trap? This is the trap that pushes people uh, headlong into anxiety. And trust me, I know something about it. Okay. This is what happens. We begin to think, I've got to work hard because the outcome rests on my hard work. I've got to work hard because the outcome rests on whatever I can figure out at 2 o'clock in the morning, okay? Whatever I can think about at burning the candle at both ends, if I can work it out, then it will work out, and that is the trap. Many of us think that's where the edge comes from. Like, man, I've, I, you know, I push harder than everybody else because I'm convinced that the outcome rests on me. Well, you know what this passage does? This passage frees us from that because you know what it says? It says that you can build all day, burn the candle at both ends, you can stay awake at night, eat the bread of anxious toil, but if the Lord don't build the house, it don't get built. And what that means is it's not all on you. Okay, so the question is, well, how does that not lead us to the trust, but then it makes us passive in work. We're like, well, God's just over it all. This is the secret, y'all. We don't work for an outcome. You could say it like this. We don't work hard because it secures an, outwork, an outcome. We work hard because it's his children he's called us to. And that's the difference. 
1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us that we do all things to the glory of God because we are his children. Why should you get up, work hard all day, read parenting books, try to get ahead financially, try to get ahead in your job, do everything that your boss asks you to do? Why do we do those things? It's not because the outcome of whatever it is rests on your shoulders. It doesn't. You're not sovereign. You can't see the future. Man, God has plans. He's working things in this life. It doesn't all rest on you. You work hard like that. I work hard like that. If I can get my mind right about it many times. Why? Because he has called us to. This is who we are. Our identity of his children are to be workers and ones who are cared about his glory. Now, don't you see how that unlocks the, the, the tension is, do I work hard and then have anxiety, or do I trust really deeply and become passive? But is it, doesn't, this, doesn't this solve it? This is written by one of the, the wisest man that ever lived. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, God watches even though you're watching. God works even though you're working. Here's what that enables us to do. It enables us to wake up in the morning, morning, work as hard as we can in whatever it is because he calls us to. But at the end of the day, we can go to bed, close our eyes, lay our head on a pillow knowing, God, it wasn't ever up to me to begin with. Now I work hard, but it ain't really up to me. One guy that I've learned from a ton from, man, this guy in Northern California, uh, he, uh, out in California, not Northern California, out in California, his, his name's Larry Osborne. He, uh, he's written a bunch of books many of us have read. Uh, man, this guy's seen it all, 35 years of ministry, saw a church go from 100 to 10,000 over 35 years. I mean, just an incredible resource and mentor. I've heard him say this a dozen times. Guys, when you face something hard, this is what you do. Do the best with what you have and then go take a nap. <laughs> I'm like, that's, what he, that's Psalm 127. I mean, that's where he got it from. No wonder it's so wise. It didn't come from him. It came from Solomon. We don't work hard to secure an outcome, y'all. We work hard because he has called us to. And look what that does in verse 2. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Are you tired today? And if you're, if you're tired today, is it because, man, are you, would you say, I feel like I'm eating the bread of anxious toil? You know, is there something going on? You Listen, do the best with what you have and then be able to lay your head down at night because it doesn't always uh, rest on you. There is one who watches while we can't. There is one who builds in the background of all of our building. And, you know, I want to apply this one specific way because I know this is about kids, and I, I can imagine. I know some of the, there are some of the godliest people in our church that are, are on the other side than I am. I, I've, got, I've got four kids under the age of 10, okay? And, and they're, they're, that's, that's one caveat I probably should have given here is that, uh, you know, I'm no expert. I'm still looking out the, you know, the, the, the windshield, not the rearview mirror. But that's, that's the reason I would say this. Let's don't talk about a bunch of opinion. Let's try to stick to the book, right? If we can stick to the book, then we're not having to stand on a bunch of opinion. But I do know this. It might be, it might be hard for some in our congregation, our campuses as well. Somebody might say, man, you know, I, I mean, I've done the best I can. I've raised the kids the best that I can. And I'm not where you are looking through the windshield, looking through the rear view, and some of them or one of them or whatever, they're not walking with him. And this is what, this is what I would say, because I know some of the godliest people in our church are in that situation, honestly, the people that I know personally. And here's what I would say to you. I can't really empathize with that right now because my kids aren't there yet. I mean, I'm still totally in control of most of their life. You know, I get to, I get to figure out their decision making. I, they're in my house, all of that. But I can say this to, to where you are. One of the things that you've got to get in your mind that I think that we all can get, and even now with my kids at my age, but maybe it's specifically pertinent to you, they were never in your hands to begin with. And I know that might, that, I don't know if that makes it any easier or not, but it should bring some peace when it comes to tomorrow and we're eating the bread of anxious toil because they're, maybe a child's not walking with him and, and, and you're not sure what to do and it keeps you up at night and in the morning and it's one of the most grievous things in your life. And I'm not saying the Bible doesn't give us ways to think about being sor- sorrowful and mourning and all of that, but here's what I am saying. If there's a ton of anxiety in your life over that child that's not walking with him. I know this sounds simplistic. I don't want it to sound capricious in any way. Man, you sort of got to do the best with what you have and then go take a nap. That's what you got to do. You, Psalm 127, you've got to realize God, I've done everything that I can do. I've built the house the best that I can, but really, it's you who builds the house. I've watched and I'll continue to watch, but there are times when I've got to sleep and I've got to trust that you are in control and and I've got to trust. And then then you know what that enables us to do, I think? It enables us to get around community, try to pray those kids back into the fold and then be able to go on about your Christian life and not let it ruin your witness, your mission about what God has set you on the earth uh, to do, all right? I don't know if there's some anxiety going on in your life about different things, uh, certainly when we start really getting into kids here, it can bring that up. But, man, I love Psalm 127, 1 and 2 because I think it solves that tension for us. Let's get into verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. I'm going to talk about that word heritage. 
the fruit of the womb a reward. Verse 4, like arrows, I'm going to talk about that word, in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. And blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Children are a heritage. They are arrows to be shot out uh, into the darkness that we see in this world spiritually. And finally, they are ones who will stand with you at the gate. So uh, fill your quiver with them. I went home this week. I said, babe, we got four. We need at least six more. Okay, we got to get into double digits, right? We need the quiver full. Some of our people in our church have taken this passage extremely literally, uh, which is great. Okay, I, I want somebody to mark this date down and see if our infant rooms at all the campuses just boom in about nine months. I don't know. Maybe they will. Um, he, here's the thing. Now we start to get into this. this uh, you understand the foundation of work hard but trust deeply? Now we got to apply that to kids. Kids are a heritage. Kids are arrows. And finally, kids uh, are ones who will stand with you at the gate. Man, this is so rich, okay? Let me give one more caveat. I, I wanted to give two. The first one is, hey, I'm not an expert. My kids are under 10 years old. I fully understand. Let's just stick to the book. But the second caveat I want to give is that I fully understand there could be some people in here that are like, man, what's in this for me? I'm single. I don't know if their kids are in the future for me or whatever. Others of us. Uh, might be in a situation, as you know, that Anna and I have walked through before with, uh, with miscarriage or infertility or something like that. And what I would say, to, what I would say is this, y'all, uh, I think what we're going to understand from this passage is that we're going to get into seeing that, bless, that, that children are blessing and that, that kind of thing. But one, one of the things that we've got to keep in our mind is that raising the next generation is for every single believer, okay? I understand there might be situations where people want family, they want kids very deeply. We can't, we can't turn that into an idol and start worshiping that, okay? But what we can do is maybe channel some of that and realize today that God has given you that desire for the next generation. And that next generation, it may come to you and your family and pray for that. And that's a blessing if it is. But even if not, even if that never is something that is out there, every single one of us have a place to take in raising the next generation. You know, every single one of us needs to have spiritual children. So much so that one, one of the things that people have, have commentated on for a long time is that, you know, in, the, in Genesis, they say, it, God says, be fruitful and multiply. Jesus, at the very end, says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's almost like, is there a bit of a retooling of that mandate to say, hey, uh, you know, kids are a blessing, obviously, but man, all of us need to have our eyes up. Are we raising spiritual kids? If you don't have children right now, every single thing that I'm going to say about raising kids, man, it can be applied to discipleship in general. Man, jump into the ministries of our church. You can be involved in the next generation, and I pray um, that you will, all right? Okay, okay, here we go. Uh, what, but great quote, pastor named Vody Bakum. Um, uh, here, here's what he said about this Psalm 127. I think this is right. You remember the building, building analogy, building language? Hey, if the Lord builds the house, remember the watchman analogy, like the tower, construction? I think this is what Pastor Vody Bauckham said. I think it's right. Psalm 127 in one sentence. God is the architect of life. That's what he's trying to get us to see. Like God, God is building this family. He's building children. He's building the next generation. And we've got to get involved in his program. We've got to trust God's wisdom. We've got to trust his ways. And we've got to trust his work to build the next generation of the family of God. And we can get on his program today. Man, I know this might be your first time ever coming in. Uh, but what I want you to hear very quickly here, all right, is, is this. One of the biggest sociological, I would call it spiritual warfare things that I hear over and over and over that I, for the life of me I will never understand is why we think as humans that we come natural at raising kids. I will never understand it. We think, humans naturally think they're going to be a natural at marriage, and they think they're going to be a natural at rearing kids. And it's unbelievable to me. It's a lie from the enemy. How do I know that? I just think men in general, let me just take guys, I don't mean to pick on y'all, but I, you know, just understanding where you're coming from. This is what I know about guys. You don't take that attitude in anything else in your life. You don't take that attitude about work. You don't take that attitude about hobbies. You don't take that attitude about fantasy football, for crying out loud. 
All right, you will, uh, you will go and you will say, man, I will read this. I will listen to the radio, podcast, YouTube, everything. Like I'm gonna, f- I'll put 40 hours into understanding how to build something, uh, you know, for, uh, of a hobby or whatever. But then some kind of way, many of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking this way because I've fallen into this too, that we all of a sudden think we come natural at raising kids. Let me ask you what's more complex, something at your job, making a fantasy football trade or dealing with a teenage daughter. <laughs> you, you tell me. Which one's harder? Which one's more complex? Why in the world would we think we get one naturally? I think that what we need to see here is that as we start building toward the why, the mission of God, it's now there's a lot of how and why gonna go all just like this through this whole time. But we've got to realize, man, we're maybe not as natural at this as we think. And uh, and you know, um, as we as we get in here, man, let's see what God says about kids. Let's allow what we think to be surrendered to what the Bible says. He is the architect of life. If he's the architect of life, he is certainly the architect of rearing life. I gave you guys three words as we were going through. One for each verse, three, four, and five. I don't have time to go through every, every single word of every single verse, but let's just focus on these three. And let's see, this is what I want to do. I want to lay what the natural inclination, what our culture thinks up against what the Bible says and see the collision. Let's see, let's see him crash, and then let's see which one wins out, all right? Verse 3, the word was heritage, right? They are a heri- an inheritance, some of your Bible says. Valuable, of immense value, they are a heritage. What does the Bible say? What does the world say? The Bible says children are a heritage. The world says children are a burden, doesn't it? Hey, you want to be, uh, hey, you want to be free, right? You know, you want to you want to be you want to have freedom. You know, you want to have money. That, hey, don't have kids. They're going to zap you of your money and of your energy and all that. And by the way, they will zap you of your money and your energy. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. But the world says, hey, don't do that because the sacrifice isn't worth the value. The sacrifice isn't worth what you get. Don't you see the selfishness in that? That we would say, hey, I don't want to put out. I don't want to sacrifice. My time, energy, money, all that, because I don't think the reward is worth it. Well, the reward won't be worth it if, if we think they're engineered and designed just for our joy, just for our comfort, you know, for them to get straight A's or whatever, then it totally isn't worth it. But if we understand, oh, we're raising them for God's mission in his kingdom now, and, and they will stand with, I'm going to get to this, they will stand with us one day at the gate in the mission, now it becomes worth the sacrifice. See, we live in a day and age where kids are pushed down, they're devalued like crazy, and obviously I could give a million cultural examples of this, but let me give one that's a little bit out of the box. There's a cultural writer, kind of a real pop cultural writer that I, on, generally, honestly, I don't really follow very well. His name's Chuck Klosterman. Um, he writes a bunch. People kind of, he, he, a lot of pop culture culture stuff. But one essay that he wrote just, it jumped off the page at me and it got in my mind and it really kind of messed with me. And the, the essay was called, he, he wrote a book called I Wear the Black Cat and the essay was in the book. And the essay is why the show Seinfeld is the most villainous show in all of history. <laughs> now, I, I don't know if that just got your attention. Uh, it got my attention because I thought to myself, I was like, man, that's, that's I mean, I know that the show, and I, I know some of you probably never seen it or whatever, but it is kind of a pop cultural icon. Even if you've never seen the show, I bet you could say something of the characters. It has woven itself into the fabric uh, of our society, even though it went off the air 20 years ago or, when, or whenever it was. And I, I think, and so I was like very intrigued. So I jump in and I begin to read it. And this, this was the point that he was making, that there is different forms of satire. Okay, and some satire is the late night television show that just takes a shot at whoever's the, in political office or whoever the head of institutions are or whatever. And he, he, he actually, actually goes back and he references some stuff from Malcolm Gladwell. And what he says is that type of satire does nothing to society. All you're doing is reinforcing stereotypes that everybody knows, and one side gets mad about it, the other side thinks it's really funny, or they both think it's funny, but it doesn't change anybody's opinion, it doesn't do anything. But what he said is that, and you can take this for what it is, that the show Seinfeld did something called severe satire, is what he called it, deep satire. And what that is, is most satire is from the top down, but sometimes you see satire that is severe, that is a collision sport, he calls it, that doesn't go from the top down, it goes from the bottom up. And I, and I was very intrigued, and I thought about it, and this is what he said. He says, they build a show as being about nothing. Remember that? It's a show about nothing. It's a show about nothing, but... The show wasn't about nothing. What it's about is the fact that life is about nothing. And I began to think about it. And then he said, think about all the examples of social institutions that the whole show is eroding, that's taken shot at, shot after shot after shot. And all of a sudden I was like, I could think of like 30 examples from when when I had watched. I mean, I feel like I saw every episode before I was out of my teenage years. And I was thinking about 
all of this, and I'm bringing all this back together. Okay, the one that popped in my mind, the very first one that popped in my mind is a show where uh, a guy named Jerry and this other guy named George, they decide that they are living as children. They don't have families. They don't have, you know, they don't, they're not tied down. They float from job to job or whatever it is. And they want to make a change. They want to become men is what they say. Like they want to have family and settle down and all that. And Jerry says to his friends, he, he says to one of his friends named Kramer, he says, hey, I realized today, me and George realized that we're not men, we're kids. And Kramer says, so you asked, isn't there more to life? And he says, yeah. And Kramer says, well, let me clue you in on something. There isn't. He says, what are you thinking about, Jerry? Wife, family, kids, all that kind of stuff? And Jerry says, yeah. And he says, sit down. Let me tell you what all of that means. And this is what he said. He said, kids, family, wife, the family institution, prisons, Jerry. That's what they are. They're prisons. Why? Because you can't sit at the dinner table and watch TV while you eat supper anymore. And I, that popped in my mind because I thought to myself, that is that slow erosion of the institution. And what we end up seeing through our culture is kids are a burden, and God says they are your inheritance. They are your heritage. They are the most blessed, valuable thing that you have personally, or if you don't have kids, that we collectively have as a church to steward and to bring along. Our culture views them as burdens. I know this because I've got four, and when I walk through Walmart, somebody will inevitably say, if I've got all four of them, oh, your hands are full, you know, but they sit with a little bit of an edge. Like, like I'm doing something wrong. I'm like, you know, we love them, okay? And, and uh, you know, I mean, my, I've about seen my wife. Somebody says, oh, your hands are full. And she's like, yeah, so is my heart, bud. Okay, I've seen her almost say that. I mean, of course, I'm yelling at AP to let Benai out of the headlock, and then Faith Ann spits up everywhere or whatever, you know. But it's, it's like, they're awesome. They're a blessing. Get in the truck, you know. And, and But it, isn't it that way? Somebody sees the kid and they're like, oh, man, that must be a real burden. Well, it's a sacrifice. There's no doubt about that. It's a sacrifice. But it's worth it because the scripture says they are a heritage. I've got to move here. Second thing I want you to see from verse 4 is that the Bible says children are arrows. The world says children are fragile. Coddle, comfort, right? It's all about entertaining, it's all, it's all about kind of getting, if they are, but what the Bible says is that they are rugged, they are tough, they are meant to soar, fly, be in the battle, that they are meant to go and live the adventure for his kingdom. And, and I've told you before, okay, there are times where I get to claim to be a millennial born in 1983 because I need to speak to the millennials, and this is one of those times, all right? We, and I want you to hear me, I did not say you, I said we, me. I'm worried, I'm, there's all these stereotypes about men, women, all that stuff. Uh-uh, not in our family. I'm the helicopter parent <laughs> in our family, okay? I'm the one that has a very hard time letting them go. And what I've realized over time as they have gotten older, one, one, bibl one, one uh, biblical commentator, kind of a, a, a book about kids, he said it like this. He said, the problem is we don't want to let our kids climb mountains because we're scared they're going to scrape their knees. But what if they were created to climb mountains? And this is what I want to tell our church, this is what I want to tell especially our younger generation that I'm right there, that we're bringing up these kids, is there is no way we are ever going to let them soar. You understand the whole concept of an arrow is you got to let your hands off of it <laughs> for it to work. He didn't say soared. Okay, he says arrow. If we're ever going to draw them back and let them go and let them soar and fly and live the adventure going straight for the heart of the enemy, we also got to realize that may not be the most comfortable thing for them. We've got to realize it may mean a bunch of scraped knees, and I mean that physically, but I'm, I mean it metaphorically. You know, it might mean that there is pain involved, but that is what they are created to do. And I'm telling you, we are going to have a hard time at 18 years old when that little child comes up and they say, man, I want to do City Project. I want to go to Dubai. I want to live my life on mission. Uh, it's going to be very hard for us to say all of a sudden, to, you know, to, to flip a switch at 18 and say, why don't you guys go if when they were eight, we wouldn't even let them climb a tree without standing there under them. You understand? It's going to be very hard for us to switch. And so what I want to call us to do is to realize, hey, the Bible calls them arrows. This is hard for us. How are we, we live in a day and age, it's not even politically correct to let them play with bows and arrows, okay? And they're called arrows. Like people would say, oh, that's dangerous or whatever it is. And that's what they are called. They're not fragile. God has called them to maybe more than we want to let them. And, and I think sometimes in my life, sometimes the tightness of which I'm holding on to them right now shows me, man, I, it's going to be real hard for me to just sort of let go. 
And so I've got to take steps to let them go and let them live the adventure even now. They're not fragile. They're arrows. Thirdly and finally, verse 5. This is a little bit tougher. The Bible says children should be trained in the mission. The world said, remember that word gate? Okay, I'm going to explain it. The world says, let them find their own way. The Bible says they should be trained in the mission. Okay, now here's here's why I want to say that. You know what it said in verse 5 right at the end? What it said was, this is, the, this is the verse, he shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. You know what this is getting at? What happened at the gate? I'm, I'm reading, my, our, our kids are going through the, the story of Ruth right now, right at the end. Where does Boaz go? If you, if you have any Bible background, you're going to know this. Where does Boaz go to settle the dispute to marry Ruth? He goes to the city gate. That's where the elders sit down. All right, and what this is getting at is this. If the kids are going to contend for justice, if the kids are going to think about the matters of the world in the way that you do, if the kids are going to be excited about the mission, that doesn't happen by having the world's agnosticism toward religious views and say, well, let them go find their own path. That's not how it works. Okay, well, how, the way it works is they've got to be trained in the mission. Now, I know that there are going to be secular people, all of our services, every weekend, and, and sometimes I rub people. I, this is what I would say. I don't mean to rub you, but here's what I would say. Christianity gets the rap of indoctrinating our kids. Excuse me, we all indoctrinate our kids. Everybody in society, okay? Every single person. You say, well, no, no, no. I want to let them go and do whatever they want to do. I want them to keep an open mind. Well, what if they come back to you one day and they say, hey, my open-mindedness has led me to a belief in Jesus Christ and the blood of his son has covered our sin. And if you don't believe in that, you have no entrance into heaven. See, the open-minded secular person wouldn't want that. (laughs) They they would say, well, no, that's closed-minded and we're supposed to be open-minded. Every person, I don't, I don't believe it's closed-minded, by the way, but I'm just saying, every person wants their child to stand with them at the gate so that they're not ashamed. And Christian, all I would say is we just need to understand that and do it. And, not, and if, man, if the culture wants to lob a bomb about indoctrinating kids or whatever, I would just say, man, we all do that. What we need to do is train them in the mission. Do we want them to have a biblical understanding of the image of God and how that plays with gender and race and all of these things? Do we want them to have a a, a biblical view of generosity, for example? Do we want them to understand why they're put on the earth, that it's not about their comfort, their joy, their safety, but it's about his mission? If we want them to understand those things, we've got to involve them in those things. You could could say it like this, all right? If if we want them to be in, if we want them to stand with us in the mission, then we've got to involve them in the mission now. We've got to train them in the mission now. There are so many opportunities, y'all, for you to do that. Get your kids from Route 56 on up. Man, they're getting trained in the mission over there through children's ministry. But starting around that fifth grade year, there is opportunity after opportunity with mission trips and camps and things that they can do almost monthly to continue to reinforce what you're teaching them at home. Here's what I want us to all kind of the summation of all this, the application of all this. Here it is. You ready? Y'all, let us raise children for God's glory, not our glory not their safety, not their comfort, not their entertainment. Let us raise these kids for the way that God has called us to his mission. Let us allow Psalm 127 to stand as the true north in our homes. Man, let let, let us think about it like this. Let, Let us go home and make sure that Psalm 127 is somewhere in the house that we can see that as the true north, that when we begin to build out the how, we have the why in mind, okay? I I think about it like this. Every year, October, man, me and and my sons, couple guys, we go on a camping trip with horses up in the mountains, off the grid, out of cell phones. We do that for three or four days. I promise you that when we go to lock up, when we go to hook up a 10,000 pound horse trailer with 10,000 pounds of horses in it, we don't hook that baby up to a Corvette. Okay, it might be able to go 200 miles an hour, but it ain't gonna pull. All right, you understand what I'm saying? That the way that the mission, the why, what you're trying to do with them is gonna determine the way that we should build them out. It's gonna determine the how. It's gonna determine the things that we should try to bolt on and the training that they should have and the way that they should be geared all comes down to the why. And the why is not their comfort, it's not their safety. Every child has a purpose and that purpose is to find their place in God's mission and to feel the electricity of the adventure of the mission of God for the days of their life. That way they don't have to go looking for it somewhere else, all right? Now, I don't want you to think, parents, in any way that I'm going to try to heap guilt or any of that. I'm going to ask you some questions here. I'm not. I want to make sure that we're evaluating this the right way. And here's how I can tell you for sure that it's not about guilt or anything, because however it is that you've done to this point, today's a new day. 
The Bible says his mercies are new every single morning. All you can do is the best you can with what you have. Maybe you haven't had what you needed until today or until a church comes and starts to help you equip and help you kind of teach these kids about his mission. But you have that today. We all have room to grow. Lord knows Anna and I have room to grow and want to take steps to continue to grow. Let us take steps in growth together. But in order to do that, we have got to determine what the why is going to be. Is the why going to be the mission of God, or is the why going to be something smaller about grades and ball teams or whatever? And I love those things. But what is the why going to be? And you say, well, how can I get there? I've got to determine this. Well, let me give you a couple of uh, of quick little punchy little questions here to get us thinking about this. You want to know what the why is? You look at how you're building them, what you're constructing them for. Let me ask you in the bottom of your heart, do you, care, do, you, do you care more about where they end up going to college one day or that they'll be missionaries on that campus when they get there? What are we building our life for? Do we care more about them making varsity as a freshman or a sophomore or do we care more about, man, I don't care if they ride the bench their whole life as long as they view their team as a mission field and they try to make an impact where God has them right there? Which one do we, if we could take one or the other, which would it be? That's tough. Okay, how about, how about this? Do we care more about how much money they'll make or that they will be generous with the money that they have? Somebody better say oh, amen or oh my. Okay, something, I know that. You understand? These are the types of questions that start getting us to the place of understanding, is the way I am building them matching up with the why or am I building a Corvette that really should be a Jeep because it's supposed to climb a mountain? You see? Like, how, how am I building them? What do they look like? compared to what God is calling them to in his mission. Now, if the things are dawning, and it's becoming crystal clear right now, man, I, I've got to reset the mission, we've got to reset the why, then we've got to talk about the power to do that. Because these things that I've mentioned, earning capacity, athletics, and academics, I mean, that is the big three, right? Those are the things that we're all driving for. They got a, they got a big pull in our life. How do we reset the why more towards God's mission, y'all? The way we do it is by the way we change in general. It's the same way that we change in anything in our spiritual life, and that is to be blown away over God's love for us and his purposes for us. I want you to think about this passage. What does Psalm 127 say? Like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. Y'all, who is the mighty warrior? Exodus 15.3 tells us that God is a man of war. Who was the sun? Who was the apple of his eye? Who was the true arrow that he shot from heaven all the way into the heart of darkness, sent him into death, sent him into the cross, sent him to the grave? Why? Because it wasn't just about comfort, entertainment, safety, and mission. He modeled for us, even in his son, that it was about the mission of God. It was always about the mission, that this is the purpose. And here's what I want you to see. Jesus Christ came. He took the penalty for our sin on the cross. In his resurrection, he gives us the opportunity for the newness of life. God gave him over for that. And this is what I'm asking us to do, all of us, my family included. Listen, are we willing to give our children to God, knowing that God gave us his son, it will enable us to give our children back to him. Knowing that God gave us his child, right, it will enable us to give our child to him. God ain't asking you and me to do anything that he hasn't done, all right? But we have a guarantee that when we send our children out, Man, God wants their best. He has their best. Romans 8 tells us, man, for those who love God, he is working all things according to uh, their good, for our good, according to his purposes. Listen, we know that when we send our children out, that they are going into the hands of the one that we have trusted with our own souls. If we have trusted him with our soul, how can we not trust him with their soul? Now, having said that, maybe we got the why right. Let me hit this quickly and we're going to be done. There's a lot of why, but that does flow into some how. And what I want to do now is just close by giving us a how, and this is it. If children are arrows, there's some things that you got to do with an arrow, okay? Most namely, you sharpen an arrow, and then you let it fly. You send it. All right, so like arrows, our children must be sharpened, and like arrows, our children must be sent. How do you sharpen your kids? This is how you sharpen them for the mission. You don't substitute an event for a culture, if you want to sharpen them, you build a culture of discipleship on your, in your home. And you don't sub the culture out and then say, well, we go to an event that meets minimum standards. We go to an event once a week or whatever. I, man, church is an integral part of this whole thing. 
They need to be here. They need to be with other kids their age. They need to be understanding. That's what they need. I, I get that, but that is a piece. Parents, if you're, if you're at home and you're a parent, you spend about 8,000 hours with your kids apart from school and summers and all that. Can you imagine that? And what we do is we say, well, we'll take them to church and let the preacher yell for a little while. <laughs> it's like, man, you know, I mean, at best, what, what are they here, 50, 100 hours? I mean, if they're here for two hours, you know, and you're here every week, I mean, it's just nothing in comparison to what you're training them in. I'm not going to read it, but Deuteronomy 6 tells us that we should have a discipleship culture in our home. I mean, when they're sitting down, when they're away, when they're, when they're, uh, when, when they're walking, for, for me, when we're riding the truck at night, you know, before they go to bed, people, I know people think, I know you probably think we have some big elaborate, uh, you know, system of the way we're discipling and training our kids, y'all. It's 12 minutes in the morning and a little Bible story at night that happens almost every single day. It's morning and night, and then sandwiched in between is teachable moments. It, it's just, man, it's riding in the truck. Hey, did you see that? That's a good analogy for this. All the time, it's a culture. It's not an event. Do you know, have you ever try to set a culture in your home? Things that you love will trickle down. I, I'll give you an example. My kids are Gator fa- Florida Gator fans. I have never told them to be a Gator fan, okay? I've never told them that, never even thought about it. They love the Gators. They got Gator stuff. If the games are on, we watch the Gator football. They think Tim Tebow should be the president, okay, just like me. And so, I, you know, they, they, are, they, are, they love the Gators. Now, I'm a child. Listen, I grew up just like many of y'all. I'm 35 with, the, with TBS channel, which means I watched every single Atlanta Braves game my whole life, okay, until they took them off. You, you know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all that are more from, you know, if you're from this southeastern region, I mean, the Braves were it. And every, I can name every player and all that stuff. Somebody asked, asked my son, he said, he's uh, eight years old, he just turned eight. Somebody asked him the other day what his favorite Braves baseball player was. He didn't, have, he didn't know any of the players. I just wanted to rip my shirt. I mean, <laughs> throw ashes like they do in the Old Testament, okay? <laughs> How could he not know? And then I realized, like, man, I don't have a Braves hat. We don't watch the games. I mean, somebody says to me, like, hey, are you a Braves fan? It's like, of course, okay? What else, who else am I going to be a fan of, you know? But, it, but it's like, he doesn't, he doesn't know. So what do we got to do? This might be where you are today, where it's like, man, the culture's got to shift. There, it's got to be intentional. It's got to start getting real to you, wrecking your heart, flowing into them. There's got to be intentional steps that are taken. And there's a thousand things that you can do. You know, hey, well, I, hey, start watching the games. Get MLB Network. You know, go to a game. Get him a jersey. Whatever. All the, translate all that into spiritual. What are the steps that you need to take? Maybe you're like, man, I just have absolutely no idea. Well, then I would say to you a couple things to jot down. Y'all, this July, we're going to have a parenting equip class. Be there. Groups are out. We do equip. It should be one of the biggest equips of the whole year because we don't have group those weeks. Every single week you can get on the Internet, Family Resource Center at Mercy Hill's website. You just type that in. It's going to pop right up. Man, be here and grow weekly. Be in a group and grow weekly. Your kids, the one thing they need more than anything else in this life is your spiritual growth. That is what will flow down into the culture of their spiritual growth. Start a family devotion. If you need help with that, email. If, you need, if, you need like, if you're like, man, I need personalized counsel and help with that, email your campus pastor. That's why they're there. I mean, this, is, this, is, this type of thing is why we do campus pastoring. It's because, I mean, we really care about spiritual help, discipleship, all of that. These guys would love to point you to these things, okay? So email them. Secondly and finally, hey, are we sending them out? That's the thing. Arrows are supposed to be sharpened, but at some point, man, you got to let your hands off of them. There are serve opportunities through Serve Week. There are mission trips galore. There are so many things. Y'all, we've got to be willing to send them out. That's what an arrow is supposed to do, right into the heart of darkness. We need to send them out as arrows to help in the battle uh, for God's name and his glory, spiritual battle uh, throughout the whole earth where Satan has a veil where people don't really even know the name of Christ, and we have the opportunity to pierce that veil and get the word and get the knowledge and get the gospel to play. Places. I, you, know, you know at Mercy Hill, you're, we're a church that's big on discipleship, big on multiplication. This is what we say. We want to make disciples and multiply churches. I mean, we want to plant 100 churches really just domestically, you know, plant 100 churches uh, just right out of this church. I'm not talking about campuses. I'm talking about churches. You realize where most of those church planters are right now. They're in the nursery. <laughs> most of the people that will go on those things over the next 30 years 
That's where they are. Let us disciple them so that we can draw the string and we can let them go. Uh, y'all, I tell, my son, I tell my youngest son, I know some of y'all are thinking, man, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things going on with us too. There's a lot of cares in the world. I get that. I was going to tell you all this as I close. I tell, I tell my youngest son, Benaiah, he's, about, he's four years old. His brother's eight. There's a four-year gap. I, no lie. And y'all are going to think I'm crazy, okay? I literally tell him every single week, Benaiah, you only have one shot to play ball on the same team as your brother one day. And that is if you're going to be good enough to play varsity as a freshman. But some of y'all are like, man, that's a lot of pressure to put on the kid. I know, okay. Uh, I know that. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, tell, I tell him that. Hey, I tell him that. And this, this is, well, I'm kind of joking about it, but I, I, I do tell him that. And, and, and we're like, hey, wouldn't that be fun if you guys got a chance to play together? That, that's the spirit of it. This is why I say that to y'all. Because it could come off like I don't care about anything else in their life. I care deeply about all these things in their life. Man, that, they, that they're the best at ball that, that, that they can be, that they're the best in school that they can be, that they're the best with their character and behavior that they can be. But here's the deal. None of those things singularly is big enough to hold the weight of their life. There is not, a, there is not enough electricity in baseball to give him the adventure that God created him for. There's not. And if that's what he thinks it is, he's going to go try to find it somewhere else. What I want to do and what I hope you want to do, let's take all of these things that we care deeply about and fit them under the mantra of how can we use this for God's mission? Like God has gifted you in these things. How can we use it for his mission? Because that's what you were created for. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and God, I ask right now, uh, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the power to pry our hands off of athletics, academics, and money-making capacity, and realize that while these things are awesome, they're blessings like crazy, they're not the why for any of our kids. And I pray that we will reorient them towards the mission and build them out accordingly. Lord, let us create a ton of missionaries that help you, create your, help you complete your mission on the face of the earth. In Christ's name, amen.